Good day, everyone. My name is Stephen Stewart. I'm the CEO and chair of QC Copper and Gold, and I'm very pleased to give everybody a very quick update on what we've been doing uh, on the Opamisca, what we've got ahead of us, and how we really view this area. Uh, in the past, we've been talking about how our, our flagship asset, the Opamisca, is going to be reborn. Uh, but the truth is, and what I'm going to talk about today, is how this whole district of Shibugumu, Quebec, uh, once was a legendary copper district, produced billions of pounds of copper. Uh, from high-grade underground, and we see uh, our Opamisca, uh, which is going to have an updated, very large mineral resource update coming out in the not-too-distant future. It will serve as the anchor, uh, and when I say the anchor, it's going to be the largest asset by a country mile, and it's going to have a large processing facility, which is going to completely transform and ultimately uh, give a rebirth to this legendary uh, copper district called Shibugamo. So just let's recap very quickly uh, where what we've been up to in 2022. But first, of course, let's recap 2021. So at the end of the year, we published what you see there on the left, a pit constrained. So that means the mineralization I talk about is only within a defined uh, conceptual open pit. And you can see all that gold mineralization within the shaded gray area. Uh, please note, of course, outside the shaded gray area, which is the open pit, there's a ton of mineralization, which is not yet captured. We know it's there. It's been drilled historically. It's been drilled by us, but it has not yet been captured in the open pit. So we've got this open pit, uh, as described, about 104 million tons at nearly 0.9% copper equivalent. Back of the envelope, that equates to 2 billion pounds of copper uh, at 0.9%. At, at, at if you want to convert that into gold, that's about 5 million ounces of gold at 1.4 uh, grams per ton, just to sort of in gold speak, uh, to, to conceptualize how large this is. It's very large, and uh, but the competitive advantage is really is that grade. It's it's an exceptional grade when you get near 0.9% copper equivalent in an open pit, that's double a porphyry. So any, any porphyry deposit you're seeing being mined these days, they're 0.3 to 0.5, we're nearly double that. Uh, in some cases, three times it right in the middle of, of Quebec. So that's what 2021's resource was all about, uh, the, the the opening salvo. Uh, and it really was just the beginning of, of this, of defining the resource as you see it there, because there's so much more outside of the pit, but there's also so much in, inside of that gray area that is not yet counted. And that has been one of our primary objectives uh, in 2022, where since that resource was published, we've, we've drilled nearly 60,000 meters and the drills just stopped last week and we're compiling all the data. Uh, but inside that pit there, there was a lot of what we call, well, a lot of what was calculated as waste, but we know it's not waste. And we've been spending 2022 drilling it out and proving that it's not waste. So inside that pit, you're going to get a lot more mineralized material, uh, quote unquote resource. And that's going to do two things. That's going to increase the contained metal. So it's going to be 2 billion pounds plus whatever that number may be. Uh, perhaps most importantly, it's going to get our strip ratio down, we think quite materially. So instead of moving uh, that marginal ton of waste, you're putting uh, that marginal ton into the ore pile, which has exponential effects on, on the economics. So we're going to get this bigger in terms of more metal, and we're going to make this more efficient in terms of an economic uh, deposit, which we'll look to define later in 2023. Additionally, I'll point out other areas of focus is the saddle zone. It's right there in the middle. You can see uh, this is there's two mines that comprise this super pit. This is where the, the, the Springer mine was, and this is where the Perry was. This historically speaking wasn't mined in this area in between called the saddle zone. And if you look closely, you can see, you know, it's not um, optimized, meaning there's a lot of uh, uh, mineralization that's undefined. We spent a lot of time uh, drilling this. We've We've understood the direction of the veins and we drilled it out. Uh, please go to our website and you can see all, all of the results. That's quite a lot. And so we think this is going to add uh, a lot of mineralization in this area, but it's also going to change the geometry of the pit, which could also, again, could be quite material in terms of capturing this mineralization and also lo or lowering the depth of the, call it the eastern part of the pit, which is the peri, and capture some of this. So that's quite material. Uh, what we just finished drilling in uh, uh, January of 2023 was the eastern veins. We did a first pass here in 2022. We got some mineralization, as you can see here, but we went back and we we followed it up. So this has an area of a potential of expanding the pit or pulling the pit eastward, capturing some of this mineralization here and some other mineralization, which is not uh, defined here as this is 2021's model. And last, uh, perhaps most importantly, is the starter pit. In our 2021 resource, we defined... 10.6 uh, million tons at uh, one and a quarter percent copper equivalent. 
Uh, and the starter pit uh, benefits from the crown pillar, which is the ceiling of an underground mine. It was particularly thick over here. This is what we call uh, the mill zone. This is where the old processing facility was, which is long gone, but it was very heavy. And of course, they had a very thick crown pillar up to 60 meters. And so we get the, the, the high grade veins that were never mined here in the crown pillar, in addition to the bulk tonnage material, the, which is in the hanging in the foot wall here. So why am I talking about this is because, again, we focused on this area quite substantially in this program and drilled it out. So we think it's going to get bigger. Why is that important? Because it's high grade and it's mineralization right at surface. And that is going to have material impacts on our economics. Uh, the whole thesis of the Opamiska and how we view this as really the anchor asset to a district is, is to ultimately just to justify a mill. If we can prove that we're going to have a mill of significant magnitude, i.e. 25 to 35,000 tons a day, which is a big mill, sort of malarctic size mill, then everything in this entire district changes. There's an awful lot of orphan assets here that, uh, that are completely uneconomic, but if you put a big processing facility at its doorstep, everything changes. And of course, uh, QC Copper owns uh, additional assets that we're going to bring into the fold uh, to in economic considerations and future engineering reports. But the first things first is to establish that this is real and convince the market that this deposit justifies a mill. And so, uh, and hence, uh, we have to pay attention to the payback, the IRR, and uh, and ultimately the NPV. So the, the more high-grade material you get through that mill early, the better the numbers look, the more uh, convinced the world it, uh, is on seeing what we see and then this thing not only becomes a multi-decade because what you see here that's multi-decade uh, size asset but we think this has the potential to be multi-generational meaning 50-year type uh, type facility because there's a whole area which I'm going to show you in a, in a district scale map later on is just totally pregnant with with mines mineralization it just hasn't been evaluated in the context that we're looking at it so uh, now let's let's look ahead. 2023, as I said, we just finished all of that drilling. Uh, we're working very hard to get our mineral resource estimate out. We've, we've guided that it's expected to be published in June of this year. Um, we think that's absolutely realistic unless there's any unforeseen consequences, but we're working hard to do that. That's going to be a major uh, catalyst, a major milestone, just like it was when we first came out with our maiden resource. We came out of nowhere. I think this one is going to really capture people's attention. In the meantime, we've got 10,000 meters of news coming from the eastern veins, which is step out drilling, which could uh, again enhance the size of the contained metal. And then we're going to move towards preliminary economic assessment uh, on the back of that MRE, which is being published in June. Uh, a lot of the, the, the long lead item stuff has already begun, including metallurgy, geotechnical, environmental baseline, et cetera. Uh, but but then, then we put a, a PEA, which is going to quantify uh, the economics and both, also a mine plan. And mine plan is going to be very important for this asset because we are uh, very close to uh, the town of Chappé. And so how we go about mining it, uh, when we go about mining certain zones, this is going to be defined at that point in time. And then ultimately, we're moving this towards feasibility. Uh, a, a lot of the, the mineralization as defined in 2021 was measured and indicated. In fact, 82% was measured and indicated, but eventually we're going to have to uh, upgrade all of the, the inferred, which there'll be more inferred in the, in June's MRE, uh, and we'll drill that out probably in, in the end of 2023, 2024, and move it up towards pre-feasibility and then feasibility. Uh, so simultaneously, almost in parallel, we're going to be drilling the Cook and the Robitaille, which is the third and the fourth mine. I'll flip to this slide here to show you uh, for some context, this whole area. So when I say this is the rebirth uh, of a total district here, this whole area is just pregnant with resources. We own an awful lot of it. We've got four mines here, the Spring and the Perry, which is what I've been talking about exclusively thus far. The Opamiska, when it was operated by Falconbridge, was four mines. You can see they're all very proximate to each other. The Springer and the Perry are the super pit. We're going to drill out the Cook and the Robitaille, and I'll just a little, a little word about those. Uh, just like Springer and Perry, the Cook and the Robitaille had a huge database. We have it. We've modeled it. We've digitized it. We understand what it is. Now what needs to happen is that it needs to be drilled out just like Springer and Perry has been. So QC Copper spent the last more or less two years defining Springer and Perry in the context of 43-101. And uh, we have at least 2 billion pounds and is going to get bigger this year. We're going to rinse and repeat same process on Cook and Robitaille so that its material can be processed you know, at the at the facility over here. This is all within, a, you know, two or three kilometers of each other. It's very proximate. Everything is on the rail. You can see the infrastructure there. This goes to the horn smelter where all the copper 
um, concentrates get shipped. Alternatively, you can sh uh, ship it to um, Tidewater in Bay Como. Uh, you can also see here we own another deposit. This is the Roger deposit. It's a half million ounces of gold. Uh, this is the sort of thing that, you know, on its own, half a million ounces isn't all that interesting unless you have a mill that, on the rail that you can send it to. And then as without getting into the details of what other deposits are where, uh, rest assured this area here, which I'm sort of uh, outlining the Gwilym Fault, which is the structure, the mineralized uh, geological feature that, that gave birth to this area and just precipitated out copious amounts of copper and gold. And if we can have this facility here, uh, this whole area becomes um, game on. Uh, it'll be the copper district in Eastern Canada, uh, no question about it. It's very exciting, but it's early days and there's work to be done. Our vision is really, you know, it's it's based off the same principles of Malarctic and Detour. Uh, to put things in scale, everybody says you have to be, you know, super big for um, a base metals project and they're not wrong, however, uh, when you look at Malarctic, which is Canada's largest gold mine, its maiden resources was 6 million ounces. If you put our maiden resource in the context, we're 5 million ounces. And, I, and I'm and i quite certain it's going to get larger um, come June. So uh, we are plenty big enough. Um, and then we're going to get bigger, just like Malarctic is, is now mining its Odyssey. Okay, Nobody knew Odyssey existed when it was sold to Agnico uh, nearly nine years ago. But again, this, that, the Malarctic is a generational mining opportunity, but you have to start first with defining the economics and justifying a mill. And then you just know you're going to be mining this thing, you know, uh, I don't want to say in perpetuity, but for an awful, a, a much longer time than any economic study can currently capture. Same thing with detour, it just keeps on getting bigger. Um, it's it's an, these are two absolutely uh, monster deposits that again just like the Okamiska have been redefined from underground high grade situations into bulk bulk tonnage. So that's the sort of vision we have for Shibugumu. Uh, it produced a ton of copper uh, in the high grade underground context, and it's going to we believe it's going to do the same thing, but in a big open pit that's going to be around uh, for a long time. Our competitive advantage, everybody evaluates um, uh, assets, uh, apples to apples, and they look at the Opamiska, and they're confused because we're not a porphyry and we're not um, a $10 billion capex or a, or a 5 billion ton resource, and we don't want to be. Um, we're just the right size for exactly where we are. Uh, this is the sort of asset that can be developed this cycle. It's plenty big, as I said, as is. It's about a 20-year mine life, if you were to put in certain uh, reasonable parameters, but we do think this has 50 year, 60 year potential when you sort of look at it in, in broad scopes uh, and all the other mineralization there. But when you're looking at the porphyries, it's all about grade. You can see there, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, if you're lucky, uh, um, we're nearly 0 0.9 and that's all near surface. And again, that's very important to, to understand. Some of these porphyries don't begin right at surface, but nonetheless, that is our competitive advantage is that we have a huge grade leap up, upon these porphyries. And grade is, everybody says grade is king, and I think that's true, but I, again, I'll emphasize margin is king. So, you know, um, you have to make money. So 0.9% copper, if it's a kilometer deep, isn't going to be quite as interesting if it's right at your um, uh, doorstep, uh, so to speak, right at surface, right on the rail with a processing facility uh, at the end of the, that, that rail line. So this project benefits, the Opamiska benefits from having all that infrastructure in place, having twice the grade of a comparable porphyry project and being in Quebec with, with everything there, the infrastructure, the community, the provincial support, et cetera. And, and let's just say, like go back in terms of size, we're in top 20 in the Americas in terms of size. So even though we're not a massive porphyry, we're in the top 20, uh, but we're the top three, we're the third in terms of grade. So these are our competitive advantages, expect us to play to them. One other point I wanna talk about is copper in Canada and why being in Canada really does matter. I wanna talk about the provenance of the strategic metal and security of supply. Um, the ore group in QC Copper is exclusively focused in Canada and, and for very good reason. Uh, it's been a longstanding policy of ours, which I think is gain, going to be more and more relevant. Um, I reference here Blood Diamond and I just use the diamonds. Uh, when that was in the 90s, that, that came out in the 90s, or early 2000s, that was sort of revolutionary in how people viewed how mining was actually done uh, through child labor, um, forced labor, all sorts of terrible things happening. I think the same thing is going on in Africa right now. And people are starting to ask more and more question is where does my copper come from? Where does my nickel come from? As geopolitical issues arise with China and Russia, 
Uh, again, looking at a guy like Peter Zeehan, who talks about the end of globalization or certainly uh, a restructuring of globalization. I think, again, the province, where are we getting these metals? Who does it come from? Who is benefiting from the purchase of these assets is going to ultimately be incorporated uh, into a premium for Canadian assets. So I think uh, Canadian assets, particularly Quebec, we're going to be valued very high by uh, a company who wants to buy us because we can offer a very um, ethically produced, clean, green uh, product that is produced with hydroelectric power. And of course, we've got security of supply. So if uh, geopolitical issues arise, you want to make sure you can um, uh, you don't have to worry about a boat. You don't have to worry about a war. It's it's on the continent. It's right at our doorstep. Uh, assets in Canada, the United States are going to be uh, more and more prized uh, should this geopolitical issue um, continue to, to, to be more complicated, and we think it will. Uh, so just in wrapping up, here's the Opamiska and the Quebec or Canada advantages. I emphasize we've got a district um, anchor asset with the Opamiska. We're trying to define or convince the world that we're going to put a large mill here to, to mill all of the ore uh, within that open pit. And then uh, it, it just totally unlocks that district. As it is right now, we have a very well-defined resource. We've got a ton of data, historic data, new data from our, our, our nearly 100,000 total meters that we've done ourselves, which is to find a high-grade, high-margin project in the middle of, uh, of Quebec. Uh, and everybody knows copper is the strategic metal. It's probably the most interesting um, uh, metal to be involved in right now and for the foreseeable future. And, and I'll emphasize that we are in Quebec's plan nor that has that has given us access or I should the, the project has access to railroad power airport and, and most importantly uh, uh, people and I'll talk about risks um, you know um, people is, is always uh, the biggest risks aside from geology which I think we've got a very good handle on now it's can we build this open pit and we think we can um, as as we've discussed in the past we're very proximate to the town of Chape within the district of Shibugamu we've spent an awful lot of attention um, and communicating. As you can see there, we've got the town hall. Uh, we've got the, 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 the local councillors and the mayor um, encouraging us. This is this is a mining town. There's no question about it. Quebec's a mining province. This is a, is a, is a, is a deep community with mining roots. Obviously, the Opamiska uh, really developed uh, Chape uh, many, many years ago. And, and I think the town is welcoming the economic uh, development. So I think that goes without saying. However, uh, we, we cannot take anything for granted. We meet, need to communicate with all of the stakeholders. That includes the communities, the province, the federal government, and of course, the First Nations uh, as well, who are our partners. And so it's really at this point in time about managing expectations, informing them of where we are in the development cycle. And it is early days. We're not building the mine tomorrow. Um, uh, people, uh, that that's the most common question. Are you are you buying my house? Are you moving my house? Are you building the mine tomorrow? So, you know, the answer is we don't know. Um, all of the things are possible. Uh, definitely, you know, we're close to the town. Are we going to have to move some houses? It's possible, but it's really about an economic study. Uh, we have to look at the mine plan. It's 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 very clear to us that the core of the asset is, is away from the town. Uh, but we have to have that economic uh, trade-off analysis done when we have our, our PEA in place. Um, but again, first things first is communicating with all of the stakeholders, and that's something that we've paid an awful lot of attention to. So with that, I thank you for your time. Uh, again, my name is Stephen Stewart and the CEO of QC Copper. My contacts are there, and I welcome any questions. Thank you.